Wonderful. So good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We are in the third um, installment of the School Garden Mentorship Program this year. So today we're going to be talking about classroom growing and building the garden. So my name is Addie DeCandle, and I am the uh, Food Literacy Advisor for Farm to School BC. Just to note, we are recording the presentation, as you notice. So if you don't want to be recorded, you can turn your videos off. Um, but we love to see your faces, so leave it on if you're comfortable. <laughs> um, I'd like to acknowledge that I am presenting today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, including the Saanich, Songhees, and Esquimalt nations. And it is a beautiful sunny day today, and things are starting to bud out. The persithia is just coming out. My strawberries don't look quite so sad. It's been a very nice time of year, very hopeful. I'll pass it over to Tessa. Hello, it's Gwail, everyone. It's wonderful to be here again with you all today. Um, I am calling in from the traditional and unceded territory of the Cowetsa Nation who have lived here since time immemorial. And the sun has just reached Duncan as well, come up from Victoria. And I'm looking out across Couch and Bay at Peapon Mountain and the last of the snow is melting off Peapon Mountain. So I'm welcoming, welcoming spring. Um, and all the stingy nettles that are just poking up through the ground, which is such a lovely sign that the season is shifting. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, my name is Tessa. I am a farm to school community animator in the Central Island. I'm also a farmer and a teacher, and I love that this work gets to intersect so many passions of mine. And Addie, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh yeah, I kind of got distracted by the recording. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, I'm the Food Literacy Advisor. Uh, this not for long though, this is my last uh, school garden mentorship workshop today, so bittersweet. Um, I am an elementary school teacher part-time and um, doing this role with Farm to School BC. Um, and I've learned a lot about how important school gardens are, but it's also really, really hard. So we wanted to create this network to show you're not alone, you're all awesome. You are all doing such important work and we wanna make it a little bit easier for you. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. For those of you that are new to Farm to School BC, I'll just give you a little background on our organization before we jump on. So we are an organization that has three main pillars. We support healthy local food into our schools. We develop opportunities for hands-on learning and we support school and community connectedness. Farm to School BC is a program of the Public Health Association of BC, um, which is supported by the Province of British Columbia and the Provincial Health Services Authority. Farm to School BC is organized into eight regional hubs across the province. And you can see on the map, as well as the list on the left, each hub supports a handful of school districts. So take a look, see if your school is in one of those districts. If it is, you have a community animator there to support you in your Farm to School BC work. Um, if it doesn't fall in one of those regions, please still reach out to Addie and I and we can still offer support to you. Here's a quick overview of the team at Farm to School BC um, and head on over to our website. You can see more information about the community animators and the regions and connect with the community animator in your area. So like Addie mentioned, we have a very full agenda for our workshop today. Um, I feel like we're just cusping into spring. And so there's so much to talk about this time of year as we get ready for the growing season ahead. So Addie's gonna start us off by talking about how to choose crops, which ones to grow, how and when to plant them. She is also the behind the scenes worker of all the amazing crop planting resources you see on our website. So it's great to have Addie here to share some of those resources with you. After that, we'll talk about how to grow seedlings inside and we get to hear from a guest speaker who sent in a video and he has a very inspiring setup in his classroom, growing seedlings. And last, we'll finish off moving to growing outside and how you're getting ready to build your garden beds and set up your garden for spring on its way. Like I mentioned, um, we will have a video from Paul Denby today. He is an elementary school teacher in Kamloops um, and is growing seedlings inside as well as so many other co-projects and we'll share that later on in the workshop today. So I'm going to hand it over to Addie to get us started on our first topic. Awesome. So, okay, get ready. You are going to have a bunch of information thrown at you. So take it as you can. If you know this stuff, awesome. And if not, this has taken me a few years to kind of get a good understanding of. So here we go. We're going to dive in. Um, if you are anything like me, when you go to the gardening store these days, there are aisles and aisles full of seeds and they are 
so beautiful and it's so exciting, but also immediately overwhelming. So we are going to talk about how to choose the right crops for your, um, for your garden this year and to figure out maybe you shouldn't buy 20 different things this year, figure out what you're going to focus in on. So the important place to start is, well, what can I grow where I am? So consider where you are in the province. Um, you can check out the plant hardiness zones. We have a link on our program library page here. You can see a bit of a visual. It's going to be different. So one thing that you need to uh, look up, it's really easy to find on the internet. What is the last date in spring that your area gets frost? And what is the first day in the fall that you get frost again? So between those two frost-free dates is your growing season. So this is no, no season extension, no greenhouses, no extra anything. When do you get frost? Where do you live? And then when you look to your garden, you have a look at it, notice it, go outside different times of day through the year. How much light is in your garden? Is it pretty shady? Does it get a little bit of sun or is it full sun? Total amazing solar exposure. So different crops are going to grow in different um, amounts of sunlight. So lettuce, it's going to bolt really quickly in the heat. So it's going to really like the spring times and that partial sh sun shady areas where the solanaceae, the peppers, the tomatoes, the, they need the sol, the sun to grow. So they need that full sun growing area. Also, look at how much space. I always grow way too many plants for my um, space, which I kind of do intentionally because it's there's always some crop loss and it's nice to share extras, but you don't want to overdo it either. So how much square footage do you have? Measure out your garden beds. If you're going to be incorporating it, some edible landscaping into your school zone, that would be super cool. Um, but figure out how much space you need to fill. So then when you're thinking about the crops themselves, some of the seeds are going to be planted inside to they'll need a bit of a head start or they're going to go right into the garden. Um, and if they're planted inside, do you have the infrastructure? So once you've thought about those questions, um, you're going to then turn to your classroom and say, well, what can we grow, but what do we want to grow? So you've narrowed down that huge aisle full of hundreds of seeds and varieties to what you can grow. And then within that subset, what do we want to grow here? So what's your budget? Can you only grow a have enough money to buy seeds or do you have a little bit more money because you need to purchase seedlings? Um, what is your time frame? Can you plant right after spring break or really do you only have time to start getting ready in May? So if you only, you know, your units don't line up, you can't like mental load, I totally get it. You don't want to think about growing seeds, then just buy seedlings later on in the year. And then when you're planting, you want to be thinking about, well, what do we want to grow and eat? I don't like chard, so I don't grow chard, but I grew it for like four years until finally coming to terms with, I don't need to grow this anymore. It's fine. Um, and when you're going to harvest it, what are you going to do with that food? It's so exciting to plant all these different foods. But if you don't have a plan, I've seen so much food go to waste at schools because they didn't plan how they were going to use it. So Robin shared in our discussion group a couple of weeks ago that they grow on salt spring a fall um, soup. So everything that's planted after June is going into this soup. They have it really provides a structure for the fall crops that they want. And um, there's a plan for how they're going to eat it. And in the spring, it's just a salad. You're just planting all sorts of different greens and it's harvested, whatever size it is, into a salad. So I love that it's providing some constraints and how you're going to eat it at the end. Um, and you can also be thinking about companion planting. We'll have more resources on our program library page. Um, what plants like strawberries really like to grow with dill because they're going to attract those pollinators to the strawberries and repel the pests that work well for strawberries. So if there's a couple of core crops you really want to grow, you can look into what grows well with those crops. So there's a, a few terms that we need to get into before I get too far. So these are on our worksheets. Um, they are on our program library page that I'll put a link into in the chat in a minute. Um, but indoor sow, all that means is that you're planting them inside. So those crops are ones that need a head start. And 
then you're going to transplant those outside. So transplanting is just planting the seedlings that you've grown inside or you've purchased into your garden. Direct sow is kind of self-explanatory. You're directly planting those seeds into the soil outside. Now, this days to maturity term, you're gonna see it on the back of your seed packet. Also, mess me up for a few years. So days to maturity means it's the time that the plant is growing outside. So if you've planted it inside, those weeks of growing inside do not count. So if you look at tomatoes, they might say it needs 100 days to maturity. That's outside. They also need four to six weeks of growing inside before you get them out. So really make sure that you're choosing crops and the particular varieties, because there can be a lot of differences in the varieties that you're choosing that's going to work for, well for your timing. Okay, Whew. Um, So just to reiterate those, that, that terminology, now we have some pictures so you know what I'm talking about. So there's two ways to plant seeds. One is that you're planting seeds that are indoor sown, inside your classroom. Then you are transplanting those into the garden a few weeks later, or you're direct sowing seeds in the garden. We're gonna go over a couple of examples of how to use our crop cards um, to figure out how to do this. But all crops are different, different varieties are different. It's all like an amazing learning opportunity. I've been gardening for 10 years and I'm still learning so much. So you don't have to keep all of this in your head. This information is all on your seed packet. So we know this is a lot of information and um, don't worry, always refer back to your seed packet because there's fairly important information on there. Okay, so when you're thinking about buying seeds, um, seeds are less expensive than seedlings. Uh, there's a ton of selection. You can buy local ones from your region. You can get rare varieties, you can get open pollinated ones that you can then save the seed and keep for next year, which saves on cost and is like an amazing genetics and like cool learning opportunity. And then students actually get to see the seeds growing. So that's an awesome learning opportunity to, to plant a seed, see it grow and kind of understand that cycle. Yeah, West Coast Seeds has awesome resources. Thanks for sharing that, Karen. Um, so if you're indoor sowing, you, if you're gonna be planting them inside your classroom, you need a grow station, which we're gonna go over in a few minutes uh, of what that looks like. That shelves, light, soil, your watering can, you need warm temperature. It's a bit of a setup, but once you have it, you don't need to replace it year after year. Um, you may need to pot up the seedlings, so you're gonna take up even more space than just on your shelves if you have uh, filled your shelves, which some of us do. And the seeds might fail. They might not grow very well. And there's learning opportunity there, but you might not want to bank on 100% beautiful growth from inside your classroom. So the alternative to buying seed is buying the seedlings. So you can go to a store, um, you can go to a farm and buy the seedlings. So they've already done the work for you. This is much easier. Um, and it's really easy to plant seedlings with students because they can space them out properly. They understand that this plant is going to grow into a bigger plant and they're going to space it out likely better than with seeds because it's a little bit of a learning opportunity to understand that seeds grow into a plant. Um, also, when you're thinking about seedlings, you don't need to then grow the seeds inside. You don't have to worry about the whole grow station setup that we're going to talk about and they're probably going to be bigger and stronger than you would grow anyway. Sorry, <laughs> the professionals are really good at it, much better than I am. Um, but on the con side, they're more expensive than seeds. So you might end up spending $5 for a tomato plant instead of $5 for 50 tomato seeds. Uh, you're limited to what's available and you lose that learning opportunity of watching the seeds grow. So you kind of show up with plants and if you haven't talked about where they come from, then there's gonna be a bit of a disconnect for students of what that looks like. Whew. All right, so we have developed some of the crop planning resources for, for you. So to make this process a little bit easier, there's like a lot of information. And again, there's no one right way to do any of this. You're gonna figure out what works best for you and your school. 
So if you're thinking about a spring harvest, you want to do that spring salad. That sounds kind of nice. We have uh, radish, kale, bok choy, spinach, and lettuce um, crop cards, which are two page cards. You can see an example of a PDF on the left there. And we're going to go into how to use them. And we also have regional crop planting charts, which I'll go into um, in a couple of slides as well. So if we have a look at the crop cards, we're going to look at radish. Again, so if you're teaching your students, you're making this a unit plan, think about these key terms. Teach them the days to maturity, direct sow, indoor sow, transplant terms. So looking at the package of seeds, you're gonna say, how long does it take a radish to grow? That days to maturity, 21 days, awesome. You're gonna direct sow it outside. So there's a little blank space here. Um, so you could print these off in color and have them laminated or just print them off in black and white and students can write directly on these cards that you can download from our website. So you're going to direct sow them on um, maybe when you're back at school on April 3rd. So you can fill that in right there. And students can see that the, the diagram here, that the feeds are going to grow into radishes. So think about that when you're planning the spacing. For tomatoes, they need that head start. They have a much longer growing season. So that days to maturity might be 100 days if that's the variety. So remember that that's when it's planted outside, but they still need that four to six weeks of growing inside. Um, so again, you're gonna gra grab your crop cards, have the students look at the seed package, get all of that information from that seed packet. Days to maturity, 100 days. You're gonna indoor sow it on right before you go on spring break and you're taking it home uh, March 17th, and then it, we're planting it outside in late May because then it's warm enough to do that. There are some, of course, little tricky things. So for example, winter squash, if you wanna do that fall soup thing, it's so fun to do. Um, squash can be planted directly outside or in seed banks. Different people do different things, depending on where you are in the province, it's up to you to figure out what's gonna work best. Maybe you do a little science experiment, I don't know. So the day's maturity, 55 days. We're gonna direct sow it in April, and then we're gonna be harvesting it um, in the fall. So these are the fall harvest crop cards. So this is an example of one that would be uh, harvested in September, October. So we have our spring harvest cards and our fall harvest cards. All right, so when you're thinking about your planting dates, um, we've developed these planting charts, these three regional charts. Um, I'm sure folks know about the, the West Coast seeds planting charts. So those are really focused on um, people growing anytime. So we've skewed the dates to not have a harvest when we're not there in July and August. So um, I'll go for an example for the interior. Um, so have a look at this screen here. You can see the green leaves are when you are harvesting them. So for example, for arugula, you can be harvesting at different sizes. You're gonna be harvesting it a few times. Uh, we'll put the link, it's on our uh, program library page, but we'll put a link to these in the chat as well. Um, you're gonna be harvesting them for a few weeks in May and June. So you're direct seeding them. Uh, you see that the yellow kind of seed, you're gonna be planting everything when you come back from spring break, then early April outside, and then eating them whenever they're, whatever size they are before you get out for the summertime. And you can see the coast and the north. So these were developed um, with different organizations across the province. Thanks, Addy. That was a great tour through some of the resources that Farm to School BC has to support you in this wild learning process as you figure out these tricky things like days to maturity that even I've grown for so many years and I still find a very ambiguous term. Um, so good luck <laughs> along this journey. It's such a great learning opportunity. Now that you know what you want to grow and when you need to plant it and if you need to plant it inside or outside, we are going to look at how you would start those seedlings inside. Um, and before I jump into the details of starting seedlings inside, we are going to hear from Paul Dinby. Paul Dinby is a grade 6-7 teacher at Arthur Hatton Elementary in Kamloops. 
And not only does he have a great setup for growing seedlings inside, he also grows microgreens and sells in their restaurants and has this phenomenal school garden that the communities welcome into and they actually sell their extra produce um, as fundraising opportunities at the farmer's market. So a really inspirational school gardener. We're just going to get a quick overview of how he starts his seeds, um, but always nice to be inspired by what you can do over years working with your school garden. While I'm throwing out the technology of bringing up this video, if we just want to take a moment in the chat bar to share two different plants you're excited to grow about, uh, grow in your garden this upcoming season. So take a moment right in the chat, a couple plants you are excited to grow in your school garden. And I'm going to take a minute to pull up this video. Addie, maybe while I'm pulling this up, if you want to share a few things coming into chat, it'd be lovely to hear um, what people are excited about. Awesome. Oh, Pablo, these are got fun ones. He's excited to do sorrel and celeriac. Laura Lynn's going to do ground cherries and purple sprouting broccoli, carrots and pumpkins. Bumblebee tomatoes. Oh, fun. Winter squash and cauliflower. Greens, nice. Cherry tomatoes, yum. And carrots, sunflowers and sweet peas. Oh my goodness. I am so hungry. <laughs> I can't wait for summertime. Native plants and veggies. Thanks for sharing, Addie. Before I start the video, can I just hear is are you seeing the video on your screen that I'm seeing on my screen? Just to double yep. check. Okay, great. Um, I love the variety of seeds people are interested in. It makes me Feel like there's some good seasoned gardeners with us out there too growing celeriac with your class that's always a challenge i love it that's awesome okay let's hear from paul hi there i'm paul denby from arthur hatton elementary in Kamloops, and i've been asked by farm to school bc just to talk about a couple of things that we do here that might benefit people uh, from hearing about what we do so the first question I was asked was, why do we start seeds inside for our garden? And the main reason we started was to get rid of the reliance that we had on other human beings. So we didn't want to rely on trying to find unique varieties or uh, plants that we were ready to put in the ground or different things like that. We wanted to control as much as we could with our community and school garden. So the unique varieties part, we grow a lot of different stuff. Um, we, we grow very few red tomatoes here. Uh, we like all the other colors of tomatoes and it's hard to find those plant starts elsewhere in Kamloops. So we started getting our own seed and starting them that way. Uh, we also started doing it from seed because, uh, so students can understand the process a little bit better and understand the effort and the work that went into it. So whether that was uh, babying the seeds and the starts and transplanting as we go, or deciding when to put them outside and when's the right time, all those things that go into starting the plants, we wanted to make sure that the students understood the whole process and got a good feel for it. The other part of that is uh, just the simplicity of the fact that like one little tomato seed creates an entire tomato plant. And sometimes that can be a little bit crazy when you think about what you get out of one tiny seed. And so the kids really enjoy that aspect of it. Uh, we also did it because it saves money. So it saves us going to have to buy the plant starts elsewhere. Uh, but even more so, it produces money for us because we sell a lot of our plant starts, uh, the ones that we're not going to use. And again, going back to the unique varieties, because we have those unique varieties, people are often very excited to buy the starts that we have. All that money that we spend also comes back to us. So it comes back to us, whether it's tools for the garden, um, different seed for the following years, uh, field trips, opportunities, whatever it is, uh, it allows us to buy a lot of things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to. And then unique varieties, going back to one more time, is really big for us because when we go to the farmer's market, we're often the only ones that have the dark purple tomatoes or the striated yellow and red tomatoes or whatever it is. 
we are often the only ones that have those in town. So it creates a lot of excitement through our Instagram uh, feed that way. So one more thing I'm, I'm supposed to do before I let you go, perfect time, um, is I, I wanna show you our grow setup. I was asked to show you the grow setup and what we do. So come with me, Mr. Rogers style. So these are our, our lights here. This is this is sort of where all the magic happens, as they say. Uh, we grow microgreens in the classroom that we also sell to restaurants. That's a whole nother video and another seminar. But for our plant starts, I'll try and give you a good look at this, is we like to use uh, the trays that have the individual spots. So in here right now, we have 288 onions seeded. So we like to do that because when we're transplanting, especially the tomatoes and the peppers, it allows us to uh, easily take them out without disturbing the roots as much as if you just sprinkle them in an open tray, um, like those other ones that are here for the microgreens. The lights are, there's two different kinds of lights that we use. So one of them, is, they're both Philips brand, but one of them is a daylight sunshine light and the, or sorry, it's daylight light, and the other is a natural sunshine light. One of them has a 5,000K rating, the other has a 6,500K rating. I can't remember which is which, but for the microgreens, we need at least 5,000K uh, for our, our microgreens to grow properly, so that's part of it. The other thing, we often have a heater sitting here, even though there's a lot of heat that comes up from our lights, um, we still like to have the added heat especially when seeds are uh, getting started. And then lastly for watering, I don't know where this came from or why this ended up here, but it's an awesome little tool uh, that allows for easy watering of the, of the seeds at the starts um, without disturbing them or, or over watering them and pushing them down into the soil. Oh, and soil, last thing, we use uh, HP uh, ProMix. Uh, usually the one with micro heising, my, micro heising, something like that. So we use that to use for all our microgreens and our seed starts. Even when we transplant, we might add a little bit of extra stuff, um, but that's down the road. That's probably two transplant sessions away from now. So hopefully, hopefully you've learned something. Uh, hopefully this made a little bit of sense. And if you have more questions, I'm sure you can follow up with Addy or you can follow us on our Arthur Hatton Garden on Instagram. Uh, so thank you for your time, appreciate it. Wonderful. We wanted to start with that video to give you a sense of what this can look like in a classroom. I really recommend, um, Paul mentioned that they have an Instagram feed. I would recommend following that Arthur Hatton Garden um, and we can put a link to that, but there's a lot of inspiring work going on at that school. I'm just going to pull up the PowerPoint and we'll share some more details on this. Paul was one of our uh, guest speakers last year, but he was coaching a basketball game today, so we couldn't come. Okay. Addy, just checking in. Are you seeing the screen correctly? Yeah, we're good. Thank okay. you. Great. Um, so Paul shared a great overview and shared some of the reasons why he's inspired to grow seedlings in his class. I wanna just start by sharing a story of one of the reasons why I'm inspired to grow seedlings um, in classrooms as well. So this story comes from a couple of years ago, I was teaching a grade six, seven class, and I had this slightly harebrained idea that I would let all students pair up and choose any seed from the West Coast Seed Catalog that they wanted to grow, and we would figure out how to grow it. Um, so I had two students decide to grow broccoli, and they chose this variety called Green Magic. And they looked at the days to maturity, they did some research and decided, okay, we need to start this inside in order to have hopes of being able to harvest broccoli for a salad before the school got out for the summer. 
So we set up an indoor grow station and they started growing their broccolis and they monitored them every day. They were watering them. They were measuring their growth. Um, and finally, it was early May and we decided time to transplant those outside. So they took their little seedlings and they put them outside. You can see that picture on the left. Um, there's a red circle around a tiny broccoli seedling um, and they're covering that with some floating row cover we made to protect that seedling from the cold days um, in early May. Fortunately, in May, we also had a donation from a farmer of a bunch of broccoli seedlings. And you can see in the picture of the right, there's our students' little broccoli seeding that they have fostered uh, in the classroom mixed in with the farmer's seedlings that they offered as well. And those students continued to tend the broccoli throughout May. And by kind of mid-June, they had this beautiful head of broccoli that we got to cut up and put into our spring harvest salad. And they were really proud of this wonderful broccoli that they had contributed to the salad. Um, by that point, uh, their broccoli that they shared in the classroom was still a little seedling. And the broccoli that they had shared in the salad was from the farmer's um, donation of their transplants. But those students, I think, didn't even realize because they had just felt such stewardship and connection to this broccoli crop that they had worked on since March when they selected the seeds and then monitored all the time inside that they were so connected to that plant. And at that point, it didn't matter the success of their seedling versus the farmer seedlings. They just really felt this sense of stewardship and connection to the school garden and to their broccoli. And so it just reminds me when we're thinking of reasons why we are going to grow seedlings inside, it's often not to save money or to have a better success in the end. It's really about building that student connection to the plants that they're growing. There's something wonderful about having these seedlings in your class. It's a really observable space and requires a lot of daily attention from the students. And through that, they build such a strong connection to the plants that they're growing. Um, so that's just one reason why you might be inspired. It's something that really inspires me, that student sense of curiosity, wonder, and inquiry in starting seedlings inside. Paul mentioned a bunch of other reasons why they start seedlings inside. Um, one other one I just wanted to mention is that I find our in-grow st station a really great opportunity for student self-regulation. I find when students were getting kind of wingy in the classroom, sending them over to the plant grow station, getting them to do some watering, getting them to do plant observation was a great way of just grounding those students. So again, a grow station can offer so many benefits beyond just a productive harvest in your school garden. So when you're thinking about the investing the time into it, consider that there's a lot of different uh, opportunities it can bring to your, to your classroom. So if you are interested in building an indoor grow station, we'll talk a little bit about setup. Setup can look a few different ways. Um, as you saw in Paul's video, he has a setup on this metal shelving, which is a really common and easy way to set up your plants. So this requires just getting a shelving unit. It could be a metal unit like you saw in Paul's video, really common at Costco or Canadian Tire, or it could be any shelving unit you happen to have in your class. On the right, there's a wood shelving unit. Um, the nice thing about this is it's often something you already have in your class. It can serve a dual purpose as being shelving for other things. Um, and it also just offers a really easy setup. If you're looking for something smaller, you can build an individual independent grow station. Um, this can be very economical. You can do this on a low budget um, and you can build it just to fit one or two trays. So you can either build these out of wood or you can grow, build these out of PVC pipes um, or lots of other materials you might even have around your classroom. And this can hold just a couple lights and a couple of trays can fit underneath it. So that's another option as well. If you are wanting to build one of these independent grow stations in your classroom, there is a great video. Um, it was a webinar recorded last year by Farm to School BC, getting into all the details about how to build one of these. It looks at all the tools you need, the materials you need, how to budget it out, how to build it in your classroom. Um, so I do recommend we'll link that in our program library, but head on over and check out um, all the details of how to build one of these if you're looking at doing that in your classroom. Regardless of the grow station you have, you will need um, lights for that grow station, and you can use any full spectrum lights. So those can be LEDs, those can be fluorescent lights. I really like the LED ones because they don't heat up. The bulbs are very sturdy. It's hard to break those LED bulbs, um, and they have a low energy draw. Um, doesn't need to be a specific grow lamp, but if you go online, there are tons of options for great lights for grow stations. Um, another um, equipment item that some people use is a heated seed mat. They are a water resistant mat that goes underneath your soil tray to warm up the soil. This can speed up germination for those heat loving plants like peppers and tomatoes. However, it's not necessary. Paul in his video had a little kind of space heater, um, but just a classroom ambient temperature will be enough to trigger germination for the plants you'll be growing for your school garden. 
A couple more things to consider when you're setting up lights. These lights will need to be on for 16 hours a day. So it's great if you can set them up on a timer. Timers are, um, are quite reasonably priced and they just plug into your wall in between the grow lights and the wall and you can set that timer up so that you don't need to worry about turning on and off the lights. You will also want about six inches between the lights and your plants. So as those plants grow, you'll be lifting the lights higher and higher. So you'll want some sort of system that you can increase um, the distance between the plants and the lights over time. And you'll want your shelves to be at least two feet apart because those plants might grow up depending on what you're growing to kind of a foot and a half and you want enough space for the lights to be above it. You can see in this picture, the light, the plants are touching the lights. Um, we're talking about ideal situations here, but plants grow fast once they get going. Um, so it can be hard to keep up to it. Again, I just want to remind you, all these details are in a webinar on the Farm to School BC website and we'll link to it in our program library too, because I'm really just skimming the surface of what we can talk about today in terms of building a grow station in your classroom. So check that out if you'd like to dive in for more details. Okay, so you've got your grow station, you got your lights, you got your timer, you got your trays ready to go. Now it's time to plant. A few things you'll want to consider. First is your soil mix. Um, Paul mentioned in the video he uses a pro mix. This is the highly uh, recommended mix. You can get it at any hardware store, nursery, um, but any seed, seedling starter soil mix will work. Um, you may want to add compost as well. I find compost especially helpful um, if you're going to have seedlings in those pots for a while. So if you're growing something that's going to stay in the pot for quite a while, then the plant's going to need that added nutrients. If you're just having a seedling in there for a few weeks, every all the nutrients in the seed is enough to provide that plant a good start. So once you have your potting mix, stir that up. If you are adding compost, you're going to add one part compost to three parts water. Sorry, the formatting of the slide is off, so it's hard to see that. So three pots, soil, one part compost, and then add your water. So mix the compost in the soil in your bucket, and then you're going to want to start adding water. It's really hard to water the soil in the pots. You want to mix the water into the soil in the bin before you put your soil in the pots. This soil really needs to hydrate with a lot of water. It'll probably take more water than you think. So I pour water in, stir the soil, pour more water in, stir the soil. What you'll want to do in that process is reach your hand in, take a handful of soil and give it a squeeze. That soil should clump together, um, but when you squeeze it, it shouldn't be dripping excess water. It's not a science. <laughs> you just need to get enough water in there to hold the soil together and to have well hydrated the soil. Okay. So once you have your soil ready, the next thing is getting that soil into your pots. There's a few things to mention about this. First, you'll notice in, that, in this picture that there are individual pots and they're inside a larger tray. That larger tray does not have holes in the bottom. This is really important because when you're watering, you don't want the water to drip down through your grow station through the shelves. So make sure whatever um, pots you're using, they're inside another tray um, that has a solid bottom. Then in terms of what pots you're gonna be using, um, it depends on a few factors. Paul held, Paul held up a big tray. I think it was 188 little transplant cells within that tray. Um, the size of cell depends on how long those plants are going to be in there. So if you're growing a plant that's only going to be in the grow station for a month, something like lettuce, you can use small cells because you're going to be transplanting that outside. Or if you're growing a plant like tomatoes and peppers that you're going to pot up, you can also use small cells because you'll be potting that up into a bigger plant. Um, if you're growing something like squash or zucchini, you don't want to be potting that up and those plants grow really quickly. So you're going to want to start those in one of those bigger pots, the four by four square pots. So look at your different pot options um, and see what meets your, your requirements. Um, the next thing you'll notice in this picture is the labels. Labeling is so important. Every year, I'm like, I'm gonna do a better job at labeling this year. And somehow it gets mixed up. And I don't know if it's kids moving trays or labels, but it, it always gets confusing. And the tomatoes all look so similar, all the different varieties. Um, so when in doubt, add more labels. I like to label every cell. I know that sounds overkill, but it depends on how you're moving things around. It can get really confusing. Um, the labels in this picture are likely purchased, but a cheap way to make plastic labels is just to cut up a plastic uh, Tupperware container and then use a permanent Sharpie marker on those, or you can use popsicle sticks uh, written on with pencil, that works as well. I like to fill my pots with soil, label them before I get the seeds out. So get all set up and then bring the seeds out to seed with the students. Okay, so you've got your grow station set up, you've got your soil in your containers, you've seeded your trays, they're all beautiful on your trays, the lights are shining down on them. Now it's time to wait and watch for those seedlings to come up. This is where the magic starts. I feel like this is the daily monitoring that really engages the students in this sort of work. So I, I inquire, I, I 
um, invite you to incorporate students throughout this whole process. There's ADST and building the grow station. There's so much math that can be incorporated in to that as well. Um, but I feel like this daily monitoring, if you haven't included the students yet, this is a really great opportunity to get the students involved. Um, you can use some sort of observation sheet, observation checklist to help you engage the students in these monitoring tasks. Um, the sort of things you're encouraging students to look for daily is looking for, are these plants adequately watered? Um, how are they growing? You could chart the growth of these plants. You wanna look at the color of the leaves, yellow leaves or purple leaves are a sign that there's a nutrient deficiency. So encourage the students to do the daily monitoring. You also wanna do daily watering and we're gonna get into water in a minute, um, get more details into that because that's, that's trickier than it seems. Um, other things that you're caring for with the plants over the time is probably every week, once the plants are really growing, you're lifting up those lights. And about every month, you're either needing to pot up those plants into bigger pots, or it's time to transplant those plants outside, depending on the variety. So in terms of watering, um, it can be tricky to know if you're watering your plants enough. Um, one thing with watering that you wanna be careful is when you're watering, you're really wanting to promote great root development. So you're wanting the water to reach all the way to the bottom of the tray. If you're just watering the surface, those plants won't develop as robust root structure. Um, so when you're watering, a couple of tips to make sure you're watering all the way through, lift up those individual pot, plant pots and see if there's some water coming into the bottom tray. You want the water to just be dripping through those plant pots. Once you get a sense of what's enough water, lift up the tray and feel it. Going by weight is a great way to see if you have enough water. Um, you can also look for signs from your plants. And this is an obvious one. The picture on the left is a plant not getting enough water. Don't worry, it's, don't, it's not dead. Plants can be real drama queens, and as soon as you give them water, they'll perk, perk back up. And the picture on the right is plants that are overwatered. Again, don't worry, that green algae is just a sign there's too much water. You can scrape it off. The transplants are still fine, but alter your watering. Just to go back for a few more tips on watering to make sure you're watering them adequately, um, I would focus on the edges of your trays. The center is usually overwatered and the edges are usually dry. So do a, a lap around the edges of your trays before you go to the center. And you can also flip the trays um, just to get, avoid that human error of overwatering certain sections. Paul showed that great watering device and here's a picture of it again. You can buy them at a dollar store, um, but they're really nice. You fill them with water, pressurize it at the top by giving it a pump and then you can water the seedlings. Um, and it's a great tool for students to use as well. A tip. Um, that can be useful for your students. If you figure out how much water your grow setup needs, make a marker that's, that's tape on this one that shows how much water to put in the device and then make sure the students are using that full amount of water when they water your seedlings. So there's a few tips on watering. Um, another thing to help you conserve water is you can put these domes over your trays. These domes allow for the evaporated water to be caught and kept within the system. They can be especially great if you're away for a long weekend and worried about your watering your plants. Um, two last things I just want to mention. Paul mentioned in his video the opportunity of using seedlings for a fundraiser. So if you're really excited about this indoor grow growing, um, perhaps you want to plant a few extra seeds this year. Um, and it is an opportunity to sell those seeds back to your school community, or in Paul's case, he uses the farmer's market as an avenue to sell the seedlings, and that money comes back into the garden to help fund the programs. Um, it can be a neat kind of entrepreneurial project for your class as well. So just wanted to share that as an inspiration. One last thing I just want to mention is growing seeds inside. It's such a great opportunity for science inquiry. There's so many variables at your hands that you're altering within your seedlings that it's a really great opportunity to set up some mini science experiments. So if you have extra space, plant an extra tray of seedlings and play around with some variables. Perhaps you change their light levels or their water or the nutrients that they're planted in um, and try to set up a few little science experiments within your area. It can be a great way to observe what plants need to grow and tie in your science to curriculum. Uh, into your grow station. So just a little, uh, a nudge to, to make sure there's an inquiry in this process as well. So that's a really quick overview of a lot uh, going on with growing seeds indoors. And like I said, there's a extensive uh, farm to school workshop that we'll link to on our website to give you all the nitty gritty of how to get your seedlings set up indoors. And Addy, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Awesome. So you've been growing inside for a while. We wanted to give you all this information before spring break. So if you're thinking about doing it before you go on spring break or having it ready right when you come back, um, April is getting into territory when you want to be thinking about these things. So if you're doing seedlings or you have a plan for your indoor growing, now we're going to go outside to your garden 
and figure out how we're going to build and install those beds. So when we think about garden beds, which are the most common um, ways of growing that we see in school gardens, there's three main types. There's raised beds, planter beds, and growing sets. So raised beds are um, usually rectangular. Um, thank you. Um, and they're open at the bottom. So they can be varying heights depending on how much money you have. If you want to make them a little bit higher, you have to fill them with more soil though, remember. Um, but they're open to the bottom. So you want the, the crops are going to be able to go down into the, to the lawn underneath. Um, and you want to be thinking about the kind of soil that you're buying. So you don't want to be buying, you're purchasing soil to fill it up with. So consider weed management. And you're also going to have um, plants that might come up underneath. Like my dandelions, they are voracious. They will pop up through like a foot of soil on top of them. They will come out, but that's okay. They're pulling up magnesium. Um, so think about planter boxes. They're really useful. Students are not gonna walk on them. Um, they're really nice for mapping. So when you're thinking about the size of the beds, you really don't want them wider than 36 inches because little arms are gonna have a hard time reaching it all the way across and from both sides. Um, if you have, for, in terms of length, you can make them however long you want, but if you make them more than eight feet, they're gonna bow out um, when you fill them with soil. So make sure you can see the picture on the right, just a board that goes through. And even the one on the left, as soon as it gets really long, when you fill it with soil, it will, um, yeah, expand. So when you think about the corners of the, the beds, you can either use nails or screws, but when it's full of soil, you're not gonna be able to move the screws again. So they're kind of permanent in that sense. Um, making sure they're at least four inches long to make sure they go through the two inches of the edge and then two inches into the board because you don't want the, the boards to fall off because the nails or screws were too small. Um, and you can see in this picture that the, the boards are at least two inches thick. You don't need to go thicker, but also don't go thinner. You really want that two inches. And remember that um, dimensional lumber is not quite true two inches. So remember that when you're, when you're out buying wood. So another option is planter boxes. So I've seen these um, planter boxes usually have the, the bottoms in them. The ones on the left don't uh, in the picture here, but I've seen lots of schools in Kamloops. They used to have, they have a lot of courtyards. So you can just put them right on top of the pavement or right outside your schools. They're not growing into the ground underneath the, the garden. So you wanna make sure that they're deep enough um, to make sure that the plants have enough space for all their roots and like a carrot you think like how long a carrot is if you at least want it that long it's going to need to be a bit longer than that so these are can be a bit more expensive because you have more wood and more soil that's going into them um but you can customize them to what you want so the ones on the left they have a little bit of seed eight around the edges and the ones on the right uh don't so you can make them look however you like so when you're thinking about the, the bottoms of these, you wanna put some fabric or something so the soil is not sitting right on the wood. Um, you can use landscaping fabric or potato or coffee sacks, whatever that will eventually bio disintegrate. Um, but you don't really want anything plastic because it'll just kind of disintegrate into the soil and get little bits of plastic everywhere. So you can just use a staple gun uh, and just attach it to the sides of the boxes. You can also incorporate seating and color. Like I love this picture. It's got lots of color and kid writing on the, the veggie signs. It's really fun. Um, so you can make it whatever shape. Remember irrigation though. Um, the shape of the beds will need to get watered, but you can customize it if you are building things from scratch. So when we're thinking about growing with wood, uh, growing in wood, um, you don't, if you don't know how to do this stuff, find somebody who does. You don't need to learn how to use power tools and buy all these things. Don't worry about it. There's going to be somebody in your school community who knows how to build these things if you're going to be building them on your own. So do not use treated wood. You don't want the chemicals mixing in with your food. Cedar is best type of wood to use when you're building 
uh, garden beds. It will last the longest, but it is the most expensive. Um, Mangan Zenni brought this up in our last workshop that if you can stagger when you're building new beds, that's ideal because then you don't have to replace them all in the same year. So it, that goes back to our think big, but start small. So get a few this year, get a few next year, you can stagger it out. Again, you want that two inch thickness of wood and the height of the bed should, should serve a purpose. So maybe you want it to be accessible by wheelchairs or for kindies so they don't have to bend over. Um, you can design it for what's going to work best for your school. And again, four inch nails or screws when attaching them at the corners. Another option is grow sacks. Um, they're relatively cheap and easy to install. You don't need any tools or anything. Um, and again, you don't really have to worry about weeds because you're buying soil and putting them in the grow sacks. So it's a woven fabric and it's permeable. They come in lots of different sizes. Um, and usually the 15 gallon ones can handle tomatoes and squash and stuff. So what's nice about this is you can try out a space and put them there for a year and then move them again later. They have handles, so they're not that heavy and you can move them really easily. So Tessa is gonna talk about preparing the ground underneath these things. Great, thanks Addie. So if you are growing a raised plant or a raised bed, uh, you're likely connecting to the soil underneath, or perhaps you're one of the few examples of a school garden that you're digging straight into the ground um, in your schoolyard. And so either way, you're going to likely have lawn that you need to get rid of. Um, so this is a really inspirational picture just to start us off. This is the school farm at David Thompson Secondary School in Vancouver, and they turned this grass field into a market garden with the help of Fresh Roots, an awesome uh, community partner organization working in Vancouver. So a few options to get rid of the lawn if you're on a um, you want to do this quickly, you can just get a sod cutter and you can just cut off the sod and pull it back to expose the soil underneath. If you have a bit more time, a great option can be to lay a tarp down. You want a heavy duty tarp that you lay over the lawn. Ideally, this is something you do in the fall and let the grass die throughout the winter. Um, tarps can be great in that in addition to killing the grass, it also starts warming up the soil, getting the nutrients available in the soil ready to grow for the spring. Um, so do consider that as an option as well. Um, another option instead of getting rid of the lawn is to grow on top of the lawn. So a common method used in school gardens is lasagna gardening or called sheet mulching. And that's where you take cardboard, as you can see in the picture on the left, cardboard, sometimes newsprint, you lay it down over the lawn or over the grass and weeds. And then on top of that cardboard, you start layering um, compostable materials, often a layer of nitrogen rich material. So that could be manure or grass clippings layered with carbon rich material like straw or leaves. And you keep layering that. Basically you're building a compost pile in your garden bed. And then on top of that, you're gonna um, put your topsoil and your compost ready to seed into. With lasagna gardening, you either wanna do this in the fall. So you have a lot of time for all those materials to break down or you have to put a really hefty amount of soil on top to be planting directly into, because essentially you're building a compost pile. And before you can actually, those roots can access the nutrients in that compost pile, it needs to break down. So give yourself a time frame. Um, another option is a bit of a hybrid approach. If you are just keen to get your garden bed built right now, you don't have time to wait, put your garden box there, lay the cardboard down on top of the grass, and then you can just purchase the soil and fill that garden box from there. But the cardboard will still act as a barrier between the weeds and the grass and your garden bed. So a few different options there. Um, regardless of if you are removing the lawn or using cardboard, you will likely need to bring soil into your school garden. Um, the first thing I wanna say is that not all soil is made equally. And so really do your research, talk to other gardeners, um, it's nothing worse than bringing in soil to your garden and finding that there's an invasive seed in that soil or that there's really poor nutrient profile of that soil. So do some research, make sure you're bringing in quality soil. Um, be there when they deliver the soil. You want that soil to be close to your garden. Ideally, it's down on a tarp for, to provide easy cleanup and it's in a place that can be easily moved into the school garden. So be there uh, when they deliver so you can coordinate that. The next thing is get a lot of hands. It's I think one of the best days in a school garden is moving a pile of soil. Um, kids love the work, um, bring the community members in to help out. It can be so satisfying and go so quickly when you have a whole group of people doing this work. Um, if you only have a limited number of wheelbarrows, a great option for little hands is actually just buckets and you can move soil quite quickly in buckets. So bring a bunch of buckets to your community dig day as well. 
Um, the last thing we want to mention when we're building our garden right now is irrigation setup. We're going to look in at irrigation in more detail in the April workshop, but we just want to mention it now because if you are one of those lucky school gardens and you're planning to have irrigation in your garden, you want to be designing that and setting it up when you're putting in your garden beds. Ideally, as you can see in the picture on the left, you have a little hose bib at each garden bed and those hose bibs are buried underneath the pathways um, so that it provides a smooth surface. Um, so think about that ahead of time, and ideally, as you're installing your garden beds, you're also installing at least your irrigation main lines. You can put the drip tape or whatever you're doing later, but install those main lines when you get the chance when you're doing your initial setup. Whew, okay, that was a <laughs> lot. <laughs> so Addy and I, it's so hard to know what to cut out of these presentations. There's so much to talk about this time of year. Um, let's take a moment in the chat box. Can you share in one word? How are you feeling? excited excited <clears throat> ready yay excited thank you you're welcome not reading any overwhelmed yet that's a great thing <laughs> i we 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 were worried <laughs> <laughs> Addie, i'll pass it back to you awesome um so our follow-up discussion group uh, is next Thursday, the 16th. I know it's just before our spring break here, or you might be on spring break already. Um, but if you'd like to come and join us, we would love to talk to you. Uh, just again, the same things we talked about today, growing inside, any tips for building your gardens and how to engage community for doing that. So it is next Thursday and Rowan and I are gonna be facilitating it because Tessa's on holiday. And our next workshop is Tuesday, April 4th. So it's right after spring break because we want to make sure that you are planting things, that you are thinking about things before you're planting outside. So we know lots of planting won't happen for most of the province until May, um, but we want you to be thinking about it before then. So we'll go over more with the crop cards, gardening skills, how to do it with your class, uh, vandalism and some season extension and tips and more irrigation uh, as well when you're designing it. And that will be with the new food literacy advisor. So exciting. And as always, our Farm to School Conference, it is coming up in May. So if you haven't signed up yet and you wanna come, use your Pro-D funds. It would be so fun to have all of you there. Um, we wanna get like-minded folks together and we will be there. Um, so our regional hubs, again, please reach out to the animators in your region. If you are not connected already or about food literacy at all, you can connect to myself uh, and Tessa. So yeah, here we go. That, that's the end of our presentation today. Please feel free to reach out. And our listserv has been fun to, uh, if you have any questions or folks that are sharing some ideas, it's awesome to see. So thank you so much.